right, lead heads. Welcome back to the Talking Lead Show. This is episode 210. And uh, I want to go ahead and thank our guest from last week. If you guys didn't tune in to 209, we had Charlie and Joe from Atlas Defense, and we talked suppressors. So the guys uh, were generous enough to, to stop in on their worldwide tour. Uh, they were here in Tennessee. We hit a couple of local ranges, and they were... Uh, had enough time to stop in and do the show, so we greatly appreciate that. And we got some basics on uh, suppressor education. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you have any additional questions for Charlie or Joe, you can send those to me at talkinglead at gmail.com. And we'll be glad to uh, get the answers for you. We didn't cover something that you wanted to know about suppressors. So this week, as I told you guys, um, I went to an awesome event in Ohio that Asymmetric Technologies was hosting, and uh, we've got none other than Brian Borkowski himself joining us today. Welcome in, Brian. Thanks, Marty. Appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, it's been a while, buddy. It has been a minute. We did SHOT Show together, but uh, we I did. I came on the show that time. We were running around doing other stuff at the show. I saw you a lot, though. Yeah, well, you. Uh, I saw you in passing, <laughs> and I tried yeah. waving you over a few times, but you're like, ah, I got other stuff I got to do, so... <laughs> we didn't get Brian on at our, you know, our normal traditional shot show interview. So uh, we thought this would be an opportune time. Uh, Brian, with Asymmetric Technologies, has some new products, uh, and one in particular that we're going to talk about today that he demoed at the. Was this your third or fourth annual machine gun shoot? Well, this is the second one that was kind of open. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> How about that. <laughs> so officially, this is like the second. Yeah, officially it's the second. Second annual machine. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about that product, and then we'll talk about all the awesome guns that we got to shoot uh, as well. Uh, but first, we've got to thank the people that make this show possible. Frontier Tactical. Check them out at FrontierTactical.com. They are the makers of the Warlock system, the AR-15 multi-caliber adapter that you can put on your AR-15 and be able to shoot up to 90 different calibers from your one AR platform, Brian. Which is, you know, for me, from a uh, oh shit, shit hits the fan <laughs> kind of standpoint, that's a great thing just to have, quite frankly. That's just a great one to hold on to. Well, now they make their, their full line of rifles, too, that come standard with the Warlock system on it. So this would be awesome for just your everyday personal protection gun, your truck gun, uh, your competition gun, if you're shooting competition, and uh, you just pop that warlock system, unlock it, pull the barrel, uh, whole barrel assembly out with the hand guard and everything, pop in your new one, and you're ready to go just like that. So check them out at FrontierTactical.com. Modern Spartan Systems, optimize your firearms, not just lube and clean them, optimize them with modern Spartan systems. They've got the gun oils, the gun grease, the copper destroyer. They've even got lens cleaners for your optics. And, of course, as you guys have heard me talk about time and time again, the TVT engine oil additive for your vehicles. And uh, the lead sled, Brian, is now over 300, about 305,000 miles I've got on it. I didn't drive it to Ohio. We took uh, Pepper's uh, vehicle to Ohio, so you didn't you didn't get to see the new lead sled wrap that I've got. You seen the new uh, the new wrap? <laughs> yeah, but it's the same old lead sled that you're familiar with. Uh, we just uh, we you know we we've, we've clocked it over three hundred thousand miles now, and that's due to using modern Spartan Systems TVT engine additive, and that works great on pretty much anything mechanical that you can think of. So you got um, tractors. You got what else is mechanical that people would use every day? Um, what about ATVs? ATVs. You know, you might want to check your manufacturer's specs on that, but those just run typical gas. Don't they're not gas oil mix, right? Correct. So just yeah. typical mine. Mine are anyway. I mean, you can get them in different kinds of uh, engines. I don't know if you can get them oil mix, but mine are straight gas. Both ones I have. And yeah. We beat the shit out of them, quite frankly. I know that they've been testing it in some NASCAR vehicles. Uh, there's been some uh, some big NASCAR names that we can't mention yet that have been testing it out and using it. Uh, and uh, they've got some industrial applications that they've been using their product for as well. So check them out modernspartansystems.com. Oh, and also uh, they, they said that uh, they've got a, a fishing line. People put oil on their fishing line sometimes. You heard of that? 
I have actually heard of that. They've got a product for that too. Interesting. So pretty I'm much not that good at fishing. Pretty much all your lube needs, I would say, that don't involve uh, <laughs> sexual pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, maybe somebody will figure out a way to use them for that too. But ModernSpartanSystems.com. X Steel Targets. X Steel Targets. For all your AR500 steel target needs, X Steel Targets has what you are looking for. They've got uh, the Texas Stars, they've got the Dueling Trees, they've got the uh, Hostage Targets, they've got the Big Gongs, the Silhouette Targets, Animal Shape Targets, and if they don't have what you're looking for, they can make it. So you can get in touch with Bud over at xsteeltargets.com, and uh, like I said, if he don't have it, he can make it for you. Now, I noticed you had a lot of steel targets at your range. And we beat them up pretty bad, too. Uh, we yeah. put holes in just about every one of them. <laughs> did we really? <laughs> yeah. I need to. I, I did not get them from X-Steel Targets. I, I'm not sure where our guys bought them from this time. But I tell you what, I like I like the fact that he's got ones on here. I'm just looking right now with you yes. all the way up to 50 BMG, and gosh knows we could have used that. Exactly. So I'm going to get you in touch with Bud, and we're going to get your range outfitted with some X-Steel Target. Um, yeah, we put holes. We we bought 500 steel, but we put holes right through almost every single one we had. Almost one or two of them survived. But and uh, we were we were blasting a uh, a 50 cal too. Um, yep. And it was I don't know who sighted that thing, but it was right on target. It it was it was nice. It helps when you're shooting only 250 with well, a 50 that, cal. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that is true. And speaking of right on, the official optics of talking lead. Right on USA Optics, R I T O N. And uh, those guys, Brian and I have been sitting here. Um, we're trying to get Brian fitted for a perfect scope for his new AR 15 that he's got from Nordic Components. Which is gorgeous. It's, it's a beauty. It definitely is. And uh, they've got all kinds of variety of scopes right now. I mean, the, for a new company, the variety that they have is amazing so you guys go check them out at right on usa they've got one to fives they've got four to twenties they've got five to twenty fives uh they've got three to nines uh you name it they've got it there and these are illuminated also uh, a lot of these are illuminated scopes so check them out right on usa is a veteran owned company they're based out of arizona and uh the episode that we did i guess it was two Two episodes ago with Brady, uh, we did a little basic scope education, rifle scope education for you guys, and uh, that's a series that we're going to continue with Brady. So go back, listen to that episode, learn the basics of rifle scopes, um, the parts, the components, uh, different aspects uh, of the scopes in that in that realm. And then we're going to bump it up. We're going to get intermediate in our next discussion. Uh, we'll talk about best ways to sight in your scopes. Uh, best uses for certain type of scopes. Uh, and then, of course, these guys also are getting into range finders. So we'll be talking about some range finders, best way to use range finders. Uh, and then they've got an awesome pair of binoculars, uh, Brian, that you were able to test yeah, out. Those are awesome. Uh, crystal clear. It's a 10X. Uh, I mean, you, you couldn't get a better picture out of – I've never seen a better picture out of any binoculars. The quality that you're getting out of these things, they're well protected. It's got that rubberized covering over it. They've got great covers for the lenses to protect your lenses, uh, and it comes with an awesome little carry case as well. Uh, and then the red dots, as we talked about, I guess last week and the week before, they were coming out with their micro red dot. Uh, it's the uh, Mod 3, and that should be out by the time you guys hear this episode. should be shipping. Uh, it's not on their website as we're talking right now, but they should be posting that when this show is posted. So go check them out at rightonusa.com. Yeah, I was very impressed by those binos. Um, you know, I admittedly, my uh, scope uh, knowledge is not that strong, but I've seen a lot of binos. <laughs> and uh, at, at that kind of price point for that kind of package, it was, uh, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous picture. Yeah, very I clear. mean, these are your the your $1,000 and up type binos the quality that you're getting out of these binoculars and everybody's reaction that i let try out at that event the, their first reaction was holy shit <laughs> it's uh, it without fail i mean that was everybody's first reaction it was like holy shit these are crystal clear 
<laughs> they were. I'm getting a pair. That's all there is to it. Yeah, everybody needs to add that to their, their arsenal. Glock, the official carry of Talking Lead. I rock. Uh, and I didn't show you my modified Glock that I got. I forgot to do that. Um, I had Danny over at Pack Arms do a, a custom slide cut for me. And I call it the Knights Templar. Knights the Templar, huh? Talking Lead Knights Templar. So I've got a, uh, on the sides, I've got it cut out with a, a Templar sword <laughs> on each side. I had him put serrations on the front of the gun that are kind of like a dragon scale kind of look. Sounds pretty cool. And then on the top, I've got the, on the top back of the, the slide toward the uh, rear sights, I've got the um, the cross, the Templar cross cut in on it. You got to post a picture on your... Uh, There's pictures higher. everywhere. You're behind, brother. And I am behind. <laughs> too much for that work shit. You, you've been traveling too much, brother. I have. Settling, I'm going to settle down here for the next week or two. Only only one or two trips. There you go. <laughs> Cut it down to one or two a week. I'm on I'm on your, your site right now, and I'm looking. Okay, I'm if you looking, go to I wanna see it. You know, Facebook or Instagram? I, I am on your main, but I'm going to Facebook. Okay. Yeah, don't go to my personal one. Go to uh, go to Talking Lead, uh, Instagram, or Facebook, and we've got pictures of it posted uh, randomly through there. But uh, Glock. So visit Glock at us.glock.com. And speaking of Glock, I'm going to have some great news for you guys in the next couple of episodes. I'm going to Glock this week. So as you're listening to this show, uh, I'll be at Glock's facilities in Smyrna, Georgia, uh, with what they call the the Glock Summit, the 2017 Glock Summit. So I'll be taking their operators course there, uh, and then I'm pretty sure they they haven't said, but I think they've got a new product that they're going to be unveiling. And it might be, and I'm just speculating. Well, you guys remember the episode where we had the MHS, the modular handgun system discussion, where uh, the U.S. Army was doing their competition to pick the next uh, gun for our servicemen and women between SIG and Glock and Beretta and uh, several other companies. And it you know, boiled down to, to SIG and Glock. And as you guys know, SIG came out uh, with that going on to the next phase. They haven't officially, from my understanding, picked the SIG yet, but the SIG is in the final stage uh, of that competition. But uh, that gun that Glock submitted, you've seen the pictures that we've posted uh, on Instagram, Facebook. I'm thinking that's the gun that they're going to unveil and probably release, make available to the public. So, Brian, their their new gun, the new Glock that they've got, it's a Glock. It's on a 17 frame, but it's a 19 slide. So they've cut that 17 frame down to fit the 19. So you're getting that longer grip with additional uh, magazine capacity. They've taken the finger grooves out of that grip. They've added an external safety, so you get a an ambi safety. I, I personally love the ambi safety. Maybe it's just all the time in the army that I'm used to it, but uh, I, I I like that feature. Right, you know, and that's the thing that that's one of the the features that that was a re- requirement for your handgun to have an external safety for the army to use it. So a lot of our military men and women who were trained on external safeties probably will appreciate that. I know that uh, in the public. I've talked to several people that won't buy a Glock because it doesn't have an external safety on it. So this is going to fill that void. And I'm sure they're going to continue to make their non-safety, um, external safety Glocks. So you guys don't get your panties in a wad. They're still going to have those available. But again, I'm just speculating that this is the gun that they're going to release. It's got an Ambi um, slide release also. I like that. Uh, they put a little lanyard thing on there, which, you know, millet, that's another military thing. And what else was it? Oh, it's it's going to have their MOS system, so the ability to put different sights on very easily on that top rail. So uh, that's the things that I know right off. There's some other things that they didn't disclose to me that the gun has or some internal parts that they've changed as well. I'm guessing maybe some spring, um, some new spring systems. I don't know. I'm speculating. So I just want you good guys looking, to know it's that. It's a good-looking gun there. I'm looking at it right now, 19 MHS. Yep, that's it. I like it. Yep. And it's a, that, that doo-doo brown. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I think some people were calling it peanut butter brown or something like that. But. Peanut butter brown. Yeah. So uh, you guys stay tuned. Uh, we're going to have some great info coming from Glock here in the next upcoming episodes of Talking Lead. What capacity is that mag? The um, 
the 17, I believe it's 17. Six, 16 rounds. I'm looking I'm looking right now and I think it's 17. It's 17 I see a 17. Rounds? And uh, I, I zoomed way in on the uh the mag pick there. It looks like that it's 17, 16 and 17 I see. Well, we've got the world of information at our fingertips. I'll just look it up. So I, I carry the uh, the twenty three. I'm a forty guy, Brian. You know, I'm I like one of those forty. I love forty, don't you? You won't hear me mess with forty. A lot of people, you know, bust on the forty, but uh, I, I've got you know seventeen go rounds. The Glock seventeen is seventeen rounds. How about 17 that? Seventeen rounds. Isn't that something? Hey, our buddy from uh, Tusker just texted me. Let's see what he's saying. So I told you he was going to uh, Africa. Mark hunts literally. He's a he's a world renowned hunter really and uh he, he's always somewhere every time i call me I, some days he sends me a, a picture of uh what he's gotten from wherever in the world and it's it's something different every month so so that's got to be our uh our next thing to do with him is we need to go on an african hunting trip with him oh he goes everywhere he goes asia he's climbed the mountains to go after tour and Jealous. all kinds of crazy stuff Jealous. So we'll we'll tell you who Mark is. Who we're talking about Mark in in just a little bit as we get into talking about our machine gun shoot. But uh, I hear that jack wagon train rolling in, Brian. Uh, it's coming down the tracks. Where's it going? Bring that train in, Gunny. Who rides simplified do or die? Hold them high at eighth and nine. It is time for the talking lead jack wagon of the week. So brace yourself, baby. So I was going through the news to this morning. And uh, this is Saturday morning. I'm kind of recording late than later than my normal time. But uh, you, you guys have heard us talk about those smart guns in the past. And uh, there's been a guy who, well, first off, there's a company that has released a smart gun. There's a, a smart gun that is out there, and I guess it's commercially available where people can go buy it. I think it's ex- expensive as hell. Uh, it's made by a company called, and I want to say it right, Armatix. A R M A T I X, and what it is is it's a, it's a combination. You got this wristwatch that you wear that I guess it's got some sort of a um, electronic signal that when it's close enough to the firearm, then it activates it and you're able to shoot it. But it's got its own sort of you know obviously its own frequency. So there's a guy who's been able been able to hack this system using, and I'm I'm assuming it's probably a rare earth magnet, Brian. Got a little bit of experience with those, right? With the uh, the the product that we talked about in the past, the uh, artificial shoulder pocket. Yep. Uh, those magnets are freaking phenomenally strong. I mean, they will break your finger if, yeah. if you're I not watch careful. Watch snap a lot of people who are not worth paying attention. <laughs> That's part of the fun. <laughs> I was actually you, you'll get a kick out of this. I was actually um, changing my tail light out of the lead sled the other day, and one of my screws fell down inside this hole that I couldn't get to, you know, I was like, holy shit, you know? So I went and I got the, the ASP, <laughs> I got my <laughs> ASP and I magneted that son of a bitch out of there and it just sucked it right out. <laughs> I was like, it's yeah, strong, man. It's something like 70 pounds of pull between the two. I'm telling you, I was like, yet yeah, another use for the ASP. But, uh, so this guy, um, and he goes by the name, he's got some pseudonym name that he used. He's some famous, uh, hack guy, computer hack guy, uh, Plore, P-L-O-R-E. Uh, so he recently discovered that he could shoot the gun without wearing the paired watch by placing a $15 magnet next to the weapon. See, he said he also managed to disable the weapon remotely by jamming radio signals so it couldn't shoot. Uh, so... Basically what this guy, I mean, his whole purpose was just to, I guess, find flaws with the gun, you know, find exploits. And I don't think the company hired him for this. I think he just did it on his own. Uh, But, you know, the smart guns, there's all kinds of things that I just don't like about smart gun technology. One is anything smart can be hacked, you know. So I don't want to, I don't want my life to rely on a smart gun, you know, something that could be easily hacked. The batteries run out. The batteries fell on it. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of things that could potentially go wrong with this this type of system. I'm not a, you know I'm not against technology, Brian. I love technology. And I love people who innovate, and I think it's great that people come out with products like this. I think they could be a good thing. I just don't think the technology's there yet. Uh, I don't think it's anywhere close. 
And uh, I, I would never. I I work in technology. Technology is all I do. But you would never see me put it, something like that on a gun. Right. I mean, the, the gun needs to work when I pick it up, and and that's all there is to it. I can't I can't have it tell me it's waiting on an update or some shit like that when I need to use it. No. A gun is not something that you want a computer operating. You want a person to decide when that gun needs to go off and when it doesn't need to go off. And I just see, you know, government sticking their freaking nose in on this and making this type technology, you know, going in and trying to mandate something like this, that all guns have to go in and have some sort of smart technology, which, you know, the only reason they would do it is they like to line their fucking pockets. You know, politicians, there's going to be money in it for them, and they're going to be able to line their dirty pockets somehow, some way, by doing something like this. So we've got to really keep our eyes on this technology, make sure that it is headed in the right direction. You know, I don't want to discourage it. Uh, you know, I want something to get developed. I like progress. I like technology. I like innovation. Um, but like you said, it's, it's not there. It's nowhere near being ready to release to the public yet it's amazing we call things smart but they're, they're really not smart you know <laughs> they're just it's just we used a different way right it's a different type of safety and just listening to what you said my first guess is they tried to uh you know the radio frequency sends a message that moves a magnet you know turns on or off an electromagnet or even a, a standard rare earth magnet and uh yeah there's just right there's lots of things that can go lo- wrong in that chain and uh I don't see the issues with good, proper gun training, you know, from from the right age and uh, responsibility. That's the best thing that we can do, you know, for for a smart gun is a smart person, a smart user. That's what makes a gun smart is the person behind it. A gun is an inanimate object. You know, it doesn't think. It doesn't have a brain. It will not do anything unless it's manipulated by a living creature. Or, you know, it could sit there and rust, too, I guess. So, <laughs> I mean, that's That'd something. Be a shame. That would be a shame. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people do that. They just let them sit, sit around their house and, uh, and rust. Uh, but that's going to lead to our next jack wagon that I've got. And uh, I didn't discuss this one with you, but uh, New Jersey, if you've heard about these gun buyback programs in the past, yeah, I thought they I've seen had the pile of guns that result in the uh, the little media day, right? Uh, and you know they historically they've just they've been fails. You know the the type of guns that they're getting and the object. You know they're doing it to clean up the streets. You know of of illegal guns. So what they do is they give amnesty. You know no questions asked. You bring your guns in and they will buy them back for ridiculous amounts, small amount of money for probably what a lot of these guns that people are bringing in. I mean, some people are bringing in antiques, you know, that's been in their families for generations and, you know, they're buying them back for a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, something along those lines. And, you know, this is the, the same program. I thought these had gone away. I thought they're like, you know, these don't work, you know, let's not do it. But New Jersey, nope, New Jersey is bringing it back. And they, they've had one the past couple of days. I think it's actually going on today's the last day. Uh, that they're doing it. It was like a two-day buyback program. And uh, you read the article, and it's just people, like this one couple, it's an older couple, they're like, yeah, I had a couple of guns, bringing them in, uh, and I'm going to take my wife out to an anniversary dinner for the money that we're getting from it. (laughs) You know, there was one, they were saying that uh, this lady brought them in on behalf of her uncle because he was afraid to bring them in. Um for whatever reason, I mean, you can only imagine, I mean, he's probably illegal, you know, he probably got them illegally or they were used illegally somehow and he didn't want to be tied to them. So he had his, uh, niece or somebody bring him in for him. It was pretty funny. Yeah. I'm looking at the pile of guns. I, I just looked it up online while we're talking. There's, there's some, there's some funny shit in these piles, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm looking at some kind of revolver. It's old. It's an antique for sure. It's old, but it's got probably, I don't know, three foot barrel, two and a half foot barrel. It's crazy. So one, it says, uh, my, this one lady brought them in, Donna. I said, they belong to my boyfriend who passed away. I don't know what to do with them. So I figured this is a good way to dispose of them. (laughs) I mean, take them to a freaking gun store. They'll buy them from you. Probably give you more money. Yep. Some of these things, man, it looks like people are turning in just 
because they're given no matter what condition the gun's in or or anything, they're given a set price. Yeah, so it's, I'm just looking that up. Rifles and shotguns, a hundred dollars. Uh, let's see, you get a hundred and twenty dollars for a handgun or revolver, and you get two hundred dollars for an assault weapon. <laughs> the best line is the next line. I, I'm re- Law enforcement officials on scene will determine if a firearm is an assault weapon. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because there's no such thing as an assault weapon. It doesn't exist. It's a made-up turn by the leftist liberal media to scare people into their agendas. That's that's where assault weapon came from. I mean, a freaking hammer could be an assault weapon, you know? Yeah, my favorite story about all that is uh, you look back to the the, there was a civil war in, I think it was Congo. And, uh, you know, they, they, when they tallied up the numbers, they, there was 100,000 some people killed with machetes. <laughs> Assault machetes. <laughs> right, exactly. And, uh, you know. Yeah, they're always cutting people's hands and heads off over there with machetes. I mean, that's a that's a There huge... were salt rocks back in the day, I guess. Right. It's just the right size, Sticks. right? Sticks. looks scary. Assault branches. <laughs> So there's this, the, you know, I was talking about antiques. Let's see. Uh, we found, we turned in a shot in around this. We were going to take money, blah, blah, blah. Don, who's, who's and there's one that says, oh, they're antiques, said Alley Tolls of Trenton. They were my grandfather's. Toll said it was actually his uncle who wanted to get rid of the weapons because he scared to come down, so he sent me. Uh. <laughs> But they're antiques. I mean, you could freaking get, I mean, no telling how much if they're, you know, actual antiques. And that's a lot of things. People don't know the gun. They're like, oh, I got this gun laying around here. It's been in the family for generations. Nobody's doing anything with it. I get a hundred bucks down here for it. Hell yeah. yeah. And and then, you know, these police see it and they're going, you know what? That's probably a $10,000 gun right there. Yeah, they probably, uh, they probably took a couple really nice guns off the market there. But it doesn't, them. doesn't say what they're doing with the weapons once they get them. Uh, I see a picture here online, and they're all melted down in a fire. Yeah, but it doesn't say in this article that that's what they're doing with them. Very true. That, that is, is just a, a picture. That is just a picture that wants you to think that that's what they're doing with them. I guarantee you they're cherry-picking. Those police officers are cherry-picking. <laughs> they're like, yeah. that one's mine, that one's mine. I'm taking <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But their whole their whole thing is you know, they want to get guns off the street so that, you know, if you're not using them, they're no use to you, then somebody can't break in and steal them and they get on the streets and be used, you know, illegally. Yes, but my big problem with all that is, you know, the people that are using them for crimes aren't selling them for a hundred damn dollars, right? <laughs> it's all the, it's, it's just like, it's just like the conversations with CCWs and, oh, we don't want more people to have guns. Those aren't the people committing the crimes with the CCWs. Right. These you people know, they, that are turning these guns in aren't the people committing the crimes with the guns. They're taking what I call benign guns off the street, right? The, these aren't the ones shooting people. Right. Exactly. So yet another, because, uh, I mean, it doesn't talk about how many they got or anything like that. It's just, just a little fluff story um, that they've thrown in here, New Jersey. So I'm throwing the buyback, the gun buyback programs on the jack wagon train. All of them. Yeah. They're ridiculous. And I'm going to say something not politically correct here, but I'm looking at a picture of the line of guys waiting in line. It's all old white dudes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I've said it before. It's like, if you want to get a really good deal on a gun, um, find out where these gun buyback programs are and get these people before they get in line, you know, and you'll probably get you some good deals on some guns. Of course, you might want to, you know, take them to your FFL and have them transferred properly. But in the state of Tennessee, you don't have to do that. Do you have any jack wagons you want to throw on a train? You know, anybody come to mind? It, nothing's any? coming to mind right now. There's lots of shit. You know, I, you know, I'm just not <laughs> fired up about any of them at this exact moment, which is a good thing. Right, it's still I've early been in the morning. Trying to stay off things like Facebook and and stuff like that lately, uh, just to just kind of. You get your you know, blood pressure down? Yeah, just get the blood pressure down, you know, reset a little bit. You got you enough stress in your back. life. You don't need uh, this fake news jacking you up, do you? No, nah, no. Nah. And I get more mad, you know, I get less mad at the actual fake news. I get more mad at the people who believe fake news and don't have the brain cells to figure out the difference. Or or the, I was going to say, you know, not be so lazy and just, just double check and verify it. You know, a lot of people just take it at face value. And like you said, they, you know, they won't go verify the information. There's, oh, well, 
That's what he says, and that's what it is. Most people don't even read the article because usually towards the end of all the fake news articles, they put one little smidge of truth in there or one little thing that debunks the entire headline. Exactly. They're trying trying to, you know, say, oh, no, we we told you, you know, but no one reads down to the last line. They read the headline and make an assumption and move out. And uh, that that's the part that really drives me crazy. Right. Like like this headline right here says this is why new documentary is calling the Simpsons racist. So, so people read that and they're like, oh, the Simpsons is racist and they don't read the article. You know, they don't go through and read the article. They're just all of a sudden now they'll stop watching the Simpsons or they'll start saying the Simpsons is racist. And if you read the article, which I haven't done, (laughs) 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 uh, I'm sure it's going into, and everybody's seen the freaking Simpsons. Uh, they stereotype everybody in that. I mean, the, the freaking main character, Homer Simpson, is stereotyping white people. Uh, it's a great show. I haven't watched it in years, though. I haven't watched it in years later, but I did watch it four years, and it was hilarious. Hadn't it, it been on like funny. like 50 years now? I, I don't know, man. It's it's hard to even believe I watched it when I was young. <laughs> the Simpsons. All right, we're chasing rabbit holes now. We're talking about the freaking Simpsons. Let's. Uh... Hey, I want to go back to one thing real quick. It okay. just dawned on me, too, because I'm still looking at this article online with the New Jersey buyback. Seeing all these guns that are piled up, and I'm thinking to myself, how do they keep this thing safe? You know, like at a gun show, when people bring guns in, you know, they have somebody at the front clearing them and yada, yada, yada. But gun show, there's normally not a line out the door. So you got, before the guy even gets in the building, I'm watching this line growing out the back. And a bunch of people that are unfamiliar with guns that don't know if they're probably loaded, not loaded, whatever, just standing around with nothing to do with a gun in there. Right. (laughs) Jesus. Well, it says, and and I understand what you're saying. There's a uh, in this article, it said that there were two police officers out safety checking before they came in, well, that's but nobody safety checking the people in line. Which yeah, I see the guys at the door safety checking people. I just mean there's a line going out around. Right. The, you know. I mean that's a valid point right there. So I mean somebody that's you know three blocks down in this line, if their line is even that long, um, you know, has the potential of negligently discharging. That firearm, you know, and they got to know that people that are bringing these in are not, you know, firearm um, savvy at all. Exactly. So, you know, I mean, they, they should be going down that line for each individual and uh, either making them secure it or taking it away from them or something. I mean, I don't know. That's just another potential. And we've not heard of any at this point. I've not heard of any. Oh, no, no. I haven't heard anything either. Just anything yet. But it's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. I see something else that makes me cry in these pictures. I see a, a SIG with that still has the, you know how they put that little wrap around the handguard? Oh, my gosh. New. Yeah. So there's a SIG sitting in there with the wrap around the handguard, so you know that thing's never been used. And they got they got 250 for it. No, no, no not even. No, they or got, 150. They got 150 for it. 150, one, 120. Is that what it is? 120. 120 for a handgun or a revolver. Oh, my gosh. I mean, this is one way that police departments, I guess, could uh, could arm themselves. You know, yeah. that's that's one way. You get some great handguns that way, and everybody's carrying something different. You got a Glock, you got a Sig over here. You got this guy carrying a revolver, Officer Jones, <laughs> Hodgepodge. That's hilarious. All right, let's talk about asymmetric technologies and what you guys have going on recently. I guess the last time we talked, you uh, you guys were doing your drone um, deal. And, yeah, uh, and we sold our drone company, uh, our commercial drone business. We actually sold it to uh, a company called Progress Rail, which is Caterpillar. So we basically sold our drone company to Caterpillar. Um, nice. So commercially, they're doing all all the drone stuff we used to do, bridges, um, lots of industrial and uh, uh, utility-type work. Um, so a couple of my really good guys went over there, and uh, we keep in touch pretty often. You saw one of them come out to the to our shoot the other day and fly some drones we used as targets, which was a lot of fun. Oh yeah, yeah, that um, was that was awesome. I got some video of that, by the way. I need to share with you. Yeah, I need to set up the um, the Dropbox because I've got videos that I got to drop in there for you too. Will yeah, you? but uh, you know, so we 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 got out of that side. We still do government drones. We still work for the government. Okay, so you're still stuff. into the the drone stuff. A little bit, just more. Uh, you know, we don't build dr- like from. You know, we're not we're not manufacturing out, so. drones. Yeah, yeah, we're not manufacturing. We're not doing that stuff. We're more about uh, um, tech integration. 
you know, uh, capabilities. We don't the, make the drones you use. We make the drones you use better. Th there you go. That's exactly <laughs> what we do. We do that kind of work for the government, though, so I can't – I don't touch anything that has to do with uh, commercial work on that side. Right, But, right. Uh, you know – So is there anything with the drones government-wise that you can talk about, maybe what, what they're being used for? The, the one I can talk about um, – we're doing what's called a uh, secure flight controller. We're actually building that for Homeland Security, but it has a lot of other applications. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the brains behind the drone is the flight controller. Um, you can put it on a fixed wing, a rotary wing. You can put it on a heck. You could technically put it on a ground vehicle. It just, you know, it's the thing that tells what motor to go at what time to move it. You know, okay. it, it's so all the the companies that have been selling you know, military grade or, or, or that type of drones, they all have very proprietary systems. So the government's getting frustrated when they bought these that I want to change one line of code or change one thing. And they're going to charge me $50,000 to make a tiny little change. You know, basically they're locked in, you mm -hmm. know, they, they had handcuffs on. So when you look at the, the whole other side of the industry, which is, um, academia, you know, colleges, test centers, um, you know, people doing cutting edge stuff out in the hobby market and, um, you know, even some of the little industrial markets, they're, they're using what's called open source type stuff. They're using, um, PixHawk or th there's all kinds of different things that they can use. Um, and the issue with all those things where they weren't secure. So the government saw some great capabilities coming out of these open source guys because they're all cutting edge people in universities and stuff, really pushing the limits of what drones can do. But they couldn't use any of it because it wasn't secure. Mm -hmm. So what we've come in is we, we're building a, a brains, the, the flight controller for, for, the, uh, for the drone. And that flight controller is going to be secure from the ground up. So you'll know what type of software you're running. It's going to put a partition in it to understand, you know, it one will check to make sure that what you're running is safe. And after it checks that, nothing else can get in and touch that. Um, it'll make sure if your drone goes down, so if the, the, they use it, it automatically wipes all the data on it. It'll encrypt the, the, the command and control, which you use to control it and which you use to see the pictures coming up and down. So nobody else can hack into it, take over your drone. Um, so we're putting all these security features in that will still run open source software. Uh, so we're trying to give them a secure place to use the most cutting edge stuff that's coming out. And uh, so far, it's been really successful and a lot of fun. Cool. Yeah, that does sound fun. I always <laughs> wanted to uh, get with you guys when you did one of your drone demonstrations and and uh, take part in that, but I never never could make that work out. But that if that that. That um, technology you're talking about right there sounds like you know one of these science fiction movies. I don't know. Did you ever see the movie Stealth? It I have not. Jamie Maybe Fox and Jessica Biel in it. Um, well, I like Jessica Biel, so. Oh yeah, it's an older movie. I think it was 2005 or something like that. But basically, it was these uh, full. I mean, they're drone aircraft, but they're like fighter jet aircraft type thing that are you know completely automated i mean computers running them it's not you know you don't have a driver you know driving it's completely automated so you think we're headed that way in the technology of of drones to where they're you know completely self-reliant oh absolutely i i mean it's just a matter of time whether that's you know it, it won't be in the next couple of years or anything yeah uh, probably well, won't be in my lifetime when when, when that goes to or, or the very end of my life um you think we're that far away from it? Yeah, yeah, no, I do. I, I, I mean, think I think the government's got them running right now. Oh, I think you can they're make running anything, right now. any vehicle that we drive today, any plane, any train, anything, you can make it autonomous, right? Yeah. And your biggest challenges are keeping a secure link. Um, you know, if you do something that works around the, the world, right? You yeah, know, that yeah. just increases that. Um, Satellites. Yeah, it, it, which is one way of doing it. In the government stage, you can actually get away with that yeah. you know when you look at all our aircraft today though and even the new f-35 program it's still designed with a pilot in mind right mm -hmm. you know the jump's going to come when you start designing that type of aircraft without the pilot yeah um, there's no seat <laughs> yeah no seat you know even though the whole way the future fuselage excuse me is designed is you know to, to encapsulate a person to control it up front Mm -hmm. You know, so that whole dynamic's going to shift when we really move to that next level. And I, and just for me, I haven't seen that shift yet. Right. Um, I mean, right now you can you can make it autonomous. You know, that's that's not 
you know, that's, that's capable right now, yeah. but you're really not optimized for that autonomy. Yeah. Cause you still, like you said, you got the, the communication issues, Stay, yeah. staying connected with it. Yep. And you know, quite frankly, you know, the autonomy of a person is very hard to match from a computer in today's day and age. Um, it's not to say it won't ever get up there, but you know, you know, people, people can have situational awareness and, and, and can think right now ahead of computers yeah. in, in most very complex situations that's starting to change. Um, well, it's just it's like the, time. you know, we were talking about the smart gun. Um, it's, a gun's never going to be smarter than the person pulling the trigger. Exactly. Know, the person behind I, the trigger. You know, quite frankly, you're going to have other types of things probably come out before smart gun ever really takes hold. I just, I never see that really working. Yeah. It's not a good idea, especially at this juncture. So there's other things that uh, you guys had laid out there uh, on display uh, before, you know, before you went into your demonstration of the system we're going to talk about, which is the uh, fiber opt fiber optic detection system that you guys have developed, which is fucking phenomenal. I can't wait to talk about it, but I got some questions on the other stuff. There was this uh, on the far left when we were looking in the back, this 3D bridge um, <laughs> diagram. What what was that? That was a LIDAR, um, a really high-grade you know, military LIDAR that we have uh, with some partners called Blackmore out in uh, Montana. What's a LIDAR? Uh, so laser or light yeah. um, um, detection and ranging. Okay. So when you use from from a from a gun world, when you use a rangefinder, you're basically shooting a laser out at at one point, and the reflection coming back measures how far that point is away from you. That's how a rangefinder works. Right. Right. So now think of think of from one known point, I shoot out I don't know twenty thousand lasers every second, million lasers a second, whatever at all points all around. Uh -huh. That's lidar. And when all those returns come back, I know how far away every single surface is that reflected. So I get a full 3D model of something, of the world, basically, around me from those reflected points. So if you think of it with your rangefinder, if you could take your rangefinder and, and shoot every single surface on that bridge, uh -huh. right? It's basically that's what this thing does. It sends back an image. Yep, it sends back an image from all those reflected points. And that image, you know, centimeter accuracy, sub-centimeter in some places, if you really set it up, and you, you get a real interpretation of what that bridge is, all the nooks and crannies, everything. So so you're finding maybe some cracks or flaws or something that the yeah, eye couldn't see. Yeah, you know, the bridge was just a glamour shot, to be honest with you. It was just a really cool thing to take a 3D picture of. Right. Um, you know, that was a glamour shot. But uh, what we're really looking at it for was for base defense applications. Um, because once you know where everything is, it's real easy to then tell what's moving and change detection. So once we know what the baseline is, this is what the environment around you looks like. Now I'm just scanning for anomalies or things that are moving. Um, perhaps think, think of things, I can't really go too far into it, but you might be able to make some le mental leaps. Uh -huh. Perhaps think about things that are more reflective than others. Like a, eh, a piece of glass? It, that's yeah the glass is very a reflective that's piece very, of glass yeah 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 and why you'd want to know if things like that were out there looking back at you exactly um, yeah so, that's cool so that's that's what the lighter is and that lighter in particular can go a couple kilometers out uh, with very high accuracy and uh, it also has what's called uh, doppler capabilities which can tell you know very quickly if something's moving towards you or away from you so you get real time feedback on this thing so as it's um, shooting those out you get you you on the, what you saw there on the bridge was what we took pictures and afterwards we post processed it into one picture um the stuff we're working on is much more uh much closer to real time gotcha. so you know a second delay something like that two second delay gotcha cool so i saw that and i was intrigued by that because it you know it looked like you were coming up with the next um uh, modern uh, warfare video game or something. It was pretty cool. Uh, and then to the right of that, you had this um, this helmet thing that <laughs> looked like maybe a helmet that uh, you know somebody was afraid that you know their brain waves were being scanned by the government or something. So. <laughs> the tin foil helmet. The tin foil helmet, well, right? It, it's actually a copper uh, foil helmet. 
but uh, what we were doing with that on a, just a normal Kevlar helmet, um, we basically built in an antenna on top of the helmet. So um, what we were trying to solve downrange, a lot of guys will use a whip antenna or something like that. It's real easy to pick out who the, who the radio man is and, you know, he, he becomes a target. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to, you know, distribute a very low weight antenna that actually used the shape of the head um safely it was all shielded and everything so yeah. you know it didn't fry your brain rate waves or anything right um but uh and and was able to transmit and yeah so that's what that is it's a helmet antenna so i wanted you put to... a helmet cover on top of it and you don't even know it's there you don't even see it so it gives the the, the uh, communications uh officer low profile less detectable by the enemy that's exactly so it takes right the, takes the target off his back and we built that one in-house. We didn't build that for a customer per se, mm -hmm. and we really didn't do anything with it. We, it was just an idea. We built it. It worked. You know, um, we, we, we've just kind of had that one on the shelf for a while, and it was cool. So I said, hey, throw that out there. Yeah, it looked cool. I wanted to try it on and, yeah. take, and take pictures, but I didn't. I didn't touch any of your stuff because I'm, I'm notorious for breaking shit. So They don't like me touching shit either. I have good <laughs> ideas, but uh, the, the, the guys hate it when I touch shit too because I break shit. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. And then, and then of course, you had the artificial shoulder pocket was there. We saw yep, that artificial shoulder pocket, and that's been. Uh, we just got done with a test with the um, with the British Ministry of Defense and uh, the, the, both the Army and their Marine Commandos uh, at a war fighting exercise. Um, we just got the report from them, which came back, which it showed improvement in uh, speed and accuracy for their best shooters they have in the military, which were their. Um, Royal Marine Commando shooting team. Nice. So uh, if we help the Royal Marine Commando shooting team um, improve their speed, it, yeah, it, yeah improve there, speed definitely. and accuracy on drills they do all the time. And it was noticeable across the boards. Um, you know, yeah. my, my take on that is how much we can do for, for the guy who doesn't know how to shoot or, or very novice shooter. Right. Um, and for those know, who don't know what the artificial shoulder pocket is for our new listeners, uh, what it is, it's a system that Brian has developed using rare earth magnets um, that goes on. I mean, it'll, it'll fit on your, you know, your vest, your kit, um, and it goes obviously where you shoulder your rifle. So uh, it implements a, a rare earth magnet in the buttstock of the rifle and then the, the shoulder uh, area of the shooter. That that pretty like yeah, high level great. description of it. Yep. No, that's great. And it was just a idea born from you know. Me and my guys trying to shoulder our weapons and getting very frustrated with the types of body armor that were, you know, interrupting a good shoulder weld. Um, you know that that's a that program's a labor of love. Uh, that program's got nothing to do with money for me. Yeah, uh, it, it's a black hole of money, but uh, <laughs> I, I believe in it. I, I really believe in it a hundred percent. And um, I know it was uh, when you first released it. Uh, it was very well received uh, from the audiences that we you know we showed it to. And uh, I mean, again when. When I'm looking at your stuff, and same thing with this fiber optic detection system that we're getting ready to talk about, I mean, my, my head just starts turning in all the different kind of uses and applications that that, uh, that it could be used for. So speaking of that, let's go ahead. Let's get into the fiber optic detection system, the FODs. Um, so give us give us a, a – and I guess you can talk about this openly, right? I mean, is there any – I mean, there's probably some secret stuff that you can't reveal and talk about, but uh, to the level that you can – describe it describe this system for us sure no i can describe it it's commercially available now um all my experience came from some classified military programs i worked on back in the day but uh, now it's there's commercially available version and uh, that we have so now um bottom line uh, you know first of all it's i mean it's it's seriously cool stuff yeah it really obviously is. we're using it's fiber optics wave. yeah um, what's happening, you're taking just a standard fiber optic cable. Um, we can send that fiber optic cable in the commercial version up to a hundred kilometers from one site. You know, I need something, you know, a server rack for use in a server rack, which, you know, basically, uh, I don't know, six inches tall, you know, and about the depth of a server rack. Mm -hmm. And from there I can go a hundred kilometers on, on fiber optic cable. And it breaks that fiber optic cable virtually, if you will, into five meter zones. So along that, you know, 100 kilometer path, I've got 500 channels out there. Excuse me, wow. 5,000 channels. 5,000. Wow. Little five meter sections. Um, so 50 meter, excuse me, 50 kilometers away in one direction, I could tell you if there is a somebody running, walking, digging, 
driving a vehicle, shooting a gun, climbing a fence. Um, I can tell the difference between a person and an animal, so a biped and a quadruped. Wow. Um, so basically the history of the systems came from um, – uh, actually, the Navy was, was some of the first ones really playing with it, and it was the Navy sonar guys. So how it works is when you put energy down into the ground, when you walk, when you shoot a gun, when you do any of those things, um, that energy stresses this buried cable, and you read it with the lasers, and each one of those stresses, all that energy you put in, whether you're walking or something, has a unique fingerprint to it, a, a unique signature and basically, you're just looking for that signature over, you know, the distances of the cable. Um, so from a perimeter application or a pipeline or a railroad or, or some, some kind of linear asset uh, or perimeter, that's what it's really suited for. And, uh, I mean, it does it does a phenomenal job. It does. And the demonstration that you did, you showed um, – you did several different, um, I guess, noise um, – what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, fuck. we did we we did different you know threat scenarios basically threat scenarios right see. different different noise uh you know detecting different noise threat scenarios uh, not necessarily threats but just different noises so you could just um differentiate between what was a threat and what wasn't a threat and the cool thing about it is what you guys do is each you know like walking a walking has a distinct kind of pattern running has a distinct pattern cutting a fence has a distinct pattern. So you guys can program this into your system, and once once you tell it that that pattern is a threat, then it'll alert you. Yeah, and the uh, the thing is, the real beauty of the system comes out when you start getting a little smarter than that, and and even taking that to the next level by saying, you know, in, in this area, my perimeter is right next to a road. Cars are going by all the time. So don't alert me when there's a car. Right. But if a car stops and a person gets out and walks you know, then I care. Right. Right. You know, or another location, you know, you might have a perimeter of an industrial facility or, or a utility, which is, is where our first customers are in this. And there might be somebody that walks their dog every day. Right. You don't care if that person walks their dog every day. Right. But if your fence starts getting a hit and, you know, there's other activity inside your perimeter that you can see now, now that becomes, you know, that, that's, that's how you discriminate with false alarms, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's zone based. You can, you can zone it and say in this area, here's what I care about. But over there, I don't care about that type of signal. You know, everywhere I care about gunshots, but here I don't care about walking, mm -hmm. you know, unless it's walking and fence. So you can compound those alerts and it's all automated. Send it to your phone, send it to a computer, um, you know, alert the police automatically, whatever people choose to do. You know, cameras are great and, and, you know, we use cameras in conjunction with these systems, but uh, sometimes cameras can't see because of line of sight issues. S cameras can't see because of darkness or fog mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. Um, this, these systems work 24 hours a day, 365. Um, really nothing nothing stopping them. They're three. We, we bury it about three foot down the cable, so mm -hmm. you, you can't see anything. Uh, it's completely covert. Most people will never even know how they got caught. Uh, if you try to cut the cable, you know, well, how long does it take you to dig to three feet? Because I'm going to see you when you walk up, when you put a shovel in the ground, you know, when you drive up, I'm, I'm going to see all that. Right. Um, That's another s distinctive sound, digging. You showed that, you know, you showed your guy out there digging and, you know, it had a distinctive, you know, sound wave um, related to it as well. So. Yeah, it's all automatic. There's somebody's trying to dig up your line, then you're going to, you know, you're going to know it's going to send you an alert and alarm. And sometimes it's not even a, 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 a an actual security threat, if you will. But you know, on pipelines or or something else, other buried asset like that, it might be just you don't want anybody digging in that area. And a farmer is about to unload a back. He's going to unload a backhoe and start digging there because he's having a problem and he doesn't know that your pipeline's underneath. Right. It. He's putting in a you fence know. or something. Yeah. Yeah. He's putting in a fence or something. You'll I'll know the second the guy drives up that he's on your line. And, and that's, that preventative measure for assets is, uh, you know, that's really why it's going to take off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, and you said it's a thousand kilometers. Oh, sorry. A hundred. So a hundred from kilometers? one spot. Okay. So, so commercial, the, the longest length we can go is, is 50 kilometers in each direction. And so a hundred kilometers total. So about 30 miles yep. uh, each direction. Yep. 
but think about 30 miles away, you can know if somebody's walking. Oh, that's that's huge. Yeah. And on, you know, most perimeters uh, of even large facilities, you know, six to nine miles is a, is is kind of an average, you know, five to nine miles, five to ten, whatever you want. Yeah. So we have smaller boxes that cover those types of ranges. Um, and there's things you can do for cut resilience. So you can if you have a 10 mile, you put two channels on it, one channel looking each way on the same 10 mile loop. And if somebody cuts it, you're still live, um, you know, on both directions. So. Yeah. Yeah, we use those, like I said, I had a lot of experience using them overseas. Um, and we still personally, uh, you know, we have what was the government version, but that's still government only. You know, we're a private company that's selling that back to the government. Mm -hmm. um, that one I can't give to consumers, um, but we have one that's very similar um, with probably 90% of the capability that's, uh, that's available to uh, um, commercial users. So give uh, give an example of how you used it in the military. I can't really go into too much there, um, but again, you can use your imagination. Uh, yeah. Linear assets that needed to be protected in a in a war zone or or a border. Um, but so. it could detect like um, like you were telling us like sheep. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, overseas. Yeah, I can I can a, tell you that one. Yeah. We we had an icon. You know, here you have an icon that says. You know, it's this, it's that, whatever you care about. Hey, that's a walker. That's somebody driving a car. Well, there, one of the ones we had was for sheep because there was a certain area that, you know, we, you know, you get hits and, and you just didn't know what it was. You knew it, you know, and it turned out to be sheep. So we just put a little sheep icon up there. It was, it was kind of fun. <laughs> Cause there's a lot of sheep herders over there. They there didn't. were a lot of sheep and that, that's something we didn't really care about that much. Right. You know, um, you know, it was nice to know when they were coming through. Mm -hmm. um, there's only so much I can go into on the on the government stuff, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's... it's uh, it, the technology is is amazing. And and where it was, you know, it started off in governments. Commercially, the first place it's it went to was big oil and gas. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely could see it, it there. Yeah, yeah, but very very expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, just cost prohibitive for most other users. Um, but you're also it, saying that um, size seismic activity, so earthquakes. Um, oh yeah, lightning strikes, earthquakes. Lightning strikes. You know, an earthquake. If you've got a long linear asset and you're worried about damage along that asset, when an earthquake hits, the system will immediately tell you where the most, uh, uh, the strongest waves were were hitting from that earthquake, and that's the place I'd send my response. You know, first. Right. Uh, and then there were some uh, some oceanic uh, applications for it. Um, yeah, I I don't personally get into the ocean stuff a lot. Um, I've played with it a little. I've been places they do it, but yeah, they're they're definitely looking at some yeah. more marine type applications for it. Yeah. It's a it's a different it's a different um, problem set though in in mm -hmm. those noisy type environments. Right, uh, right. But I mean, that's the application. Like I say, my mind was just running when I saw this. You know, geological. You know, the geolog geological uses uh, of it, like avalanches, earthquakes. Oh, um, my guys rung a, uh, there's, look it up. There's a little tiny place called Pagan Island out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, like literally a couple hundred miles from Saipan. Um, or, and, and they, uh, they basically went out there and rung a, a, a volcano that some years ago, the volcano on Pagan, um, erupted and, and basically all the people had to evacuate the island, right? So they went and, and put this stuff on for for the government, and they put it on the volcano, and they were monitoring remotely this volcano. Um, <laughs> I, I'm never sure. My my guys worked on it. But we we didn't really do the data part of it. We did other parts of it. But, right. Uh, so I'm not sure what happened to it or anything like that. But uh, yeah. My, yeah. So, so I just guy, googled a little, it. Uh, vacation, if you will, out in the middle of uh, the Pacific. Yeah, I'm, I'm just Googling. I pulled up some images, and there's like uh, you can see smoke coming out of that volcano. <laughs> yeah, it's it's out there too, man. I mean, look at the map. Yeah, it's it's out there in no man's land. Yes, it is way out there, and it's deserted. It's kind of cool thing though. The only way to get there, especially with all the equipment we needed, was um, to use. There was an old landing craft. So I, I'm talking about an old school. Um, like amphibious deal? Yeah, yeah, like a landing ship tank, LST. Oh, That's nice. What it is. So they actually had, you know, some guy that probably requisitioned it after the war, right? Um, it's still running and they, you load up all your stuff, you know, all your equipment in this thing. And they they took my guys to the volcano and they, they 
you know, install it on the volcano, do their job. <laughs> right. But the funny thing, we have to have a helicopter at all times on standby because, you know, it's an active volcano. It's, you know. You got some brave guys that want to go around an active volcano. And- yeah. I, they said it was gorgeous for the first day or two, and then it got old. Because <laughs> there's <laughs> just, nothing there. There's nothing else there. Uh. There's nothing there. So they were actually just, they were on the island itself. Oh, yeah. Man, that's some brave guys right there. Yep. And they had the, had the helicopter on standby in case they needed to do a quick evac. Yeah, right? or any you know medical issues that arise or something like that. Because, again, look at the distance. I mean, yeah. you're, you're talking. This looks like one of those islands that would be great for that TV show, uh, what's it, Survivor? Survivor. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's that kind of place, man. I mean, it is out there. Or maybe this is where they filmed Lost. Did you I, ever you watch know, that show? I doubt they tried to film it there because this place is – I mean, I, I don't even know the stats, but just just go on Google Maps and just type in Poggin Island and then zoom out and look how far away any type of civilization is. It's nowhere. <laughs> it's There's another little bitty island. There's an even smaller one, and there's an even smaller one right there. Yeah. Northern Mariana Islands. Yep. I mean, it's out in just the deepest of... The North Pacific Ocean. (laughs) Japan. I guess it's like in between Japan and Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea. Papua. And and the Philippines. It's kind of the triangle. It's very close to the same latitude that uh, Hawaii is on. Guam. I guess there's another people may have heard. It's close. Closest to Guam. Guam's probably the closest spot. Yeah. But you got those other little bitty dot islands out there too. And as you zoom in, there's even little smaller ones that that pop up so you so you guys were out there man kudos to them holy cow i actually wanted to go to be honest with you but uh i would want to go i mean i bet there's some good scuba diving out there too Oh, i'm sure there's all that shit i just uh do you guys take any scuba gear no they didn't do and and in fact they got you know obviously as you can imagine a place that isolated and remote you know a government program and we tried to use local stuff to buy and to use labor and you know all these things yeah um but you know there's a lot of poverty out there and and stuff like that so after a while the guys were just getting you know they they're trying to give everything they got and just people are just want more and more and more and more and more and right. you don't have it to give and it got a little uh you know so it, it's out there though it is it is that's cool so that's a cool application for it uh, yeah, no, that was that was that was cool, and there, there's been all kinds of stuff. You know, right now we're looking from the government side on on borders. Of course, that's a very popular topic right now. Mm-hmm. Um, we were kind of doing that before it was cool, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and we're still in that space. And and you know, we're we'd like to see it on the U.S. border. So and there's talks about that. And um, you know, the the next stuff is. Uh, you know, nuclear facilities, but then everything too, as benign as utilities on the commercial side is really what we're going after. Mm-hmm. Utility companies and... Um, well, like you said, digging. I mean, um, I can see utilities, just local utility companies, you know, being able to, to benefit from this too. Because, you know, you always got people digging in their backyards and, you know, hitting gas lines. Exactly. And and those are the people we're talking to. Yeah. So they could immediately get an alert said, oh, freaking Joe Bob's out there putting in a fence, something getting ready to hit our gas line. They're supposed to call, you know, you're supposed to call before you start digging, but a lot of people don't do that. Yeah, call before you dig. So do you have this uh, on your website, the uh, the FODs? You yeah. know, it's not on our website. And, uh, a lot of things don't ever go on our website. Um, honestly, it's just now that I can just start talking about it, like before I couldn't gotcha. even talk about it. Um, and, and there's a new organization called the fiber optic sensing association that just started and they're kind of trying to get it more, more, uh, publicity and more well known. Yeah. I was kind of against that because I think something like this needs to stay quiet. I wouldn't even be talking to you or holding that demo. Um, if it wasn't for some of these other changes happening, cause yeah. from our perspective, you know, the quieter you keep something like that, the better your clients are. No, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, uh, but it's coming out in other places. So, you know, we decided cats out of the bag. Yeah. Yeah. It's out of the bag. You can't beat them. You, you join them at some point. So, right. um, no, it eventually we'll have all that up there and I'm working on getting it now. It, it, uh, now you're just going to be, you know, you're just going to have to come up 
with uh, more ways that it can't be defeated. So, yeah, which is going to improve the technology, which is good. Absolutely, and there's just a natural evolution of that stuff. I didn't want it to start this soon, but it started. So, uh, you know, we we adapt to our environment and keep moving. Well, I was very impressed with it, and like I said, I my wheels were turning coming up with all kinds of applications for this. Um, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, they just go to Asymmetric Technologies if they're interested in this product. Yeah, I know we got a lot of you know we got a lot of commercial people that listen to this. Military, obviously, uh, law enforcement that listen. Yeah, Asymmetric Technologies um, is the name of the company, and Asymmetric.com, um, and you, you can call into the main site. You can you know heck any any of the leadheads reach out to you. To Absolutely, my stuff. I don't like to throw my stuff out there willy-nilly because we, we get too much junk i got but, you uh, yeah just yeah. reach out to uh talking at gmail.com if you've got a question for brian uh you can shoot it to me at talking at gmail.com uh if you've got some ideas and maybe some other applications to where this uh could be useful uh send those to us as well we'll get those to brian he'll get in touch with you talk to you about that uh, and one of the other things you know when you have existing cameras around a perimeter you can use this the fiber optic to, to back all, all that information from all your other sensors, but you can also use it to tip and cue your camera. So our system gets an alert. It automatically tells your camera to look at that. Right. Um, right. Yeah. That's something that we didn't talk about. Yeah. We have four cameras for the demo Had four cameras set up. Uh, and then it was like a split screen. We saw all four cameras. And then over to the right, uh, was the, the FOD system in action. And, uh, it was basically vertical, lines going up and down so each perimeter had its own section and then as something was detected then those waves would show up and they would all be very distinctive and depend depending on the intensity you you know it it could tell you different intensity levels like you were telling us i mean you can detect uh the weight of something i mean you can't do you know specific weight but you can tell something heavier something's heavier than uh, a person you know if a car comes by or like the backhoe when it was doing its work, uh, it's very distinctive. Yeah, and those uh, those things, if you had an application like at a at a facility, right? We could see when somebody opens the gate to your facility, right? We could see if a truck comes every Thursday, and that truck on one Thursday random is either way too heavy or way too light, right? We will will sense that automatically. It's those anomalies. Yeah. That you really, over time, you get a pattern of life from this system. Mm -hmm. Here's how life looks like seismically in your operations, yeah. right? And we look for anomalies and we investigate those anomalies. And, and there's both operational things that you gain from that and security. Because if you remember, we showed the generator. The generator was out running, just, you know, the generator's running. And this was the signal that the generator had. We put the choke on the generator and that the choke on the generator now turns on a whole different signal uh, on our system. So we know that that generator is not operating correctly. So that would be something to say, hey, your generator is about to run out of gas in a choke right. scenario. Or, you know, hey, that piece of equipment there is resonating differently than it does than it normally does. If you're talking about an electric, um, you know, maybe a transformer or, or some other piece of equipment isn't working how it normally does. We'll see that. Just, just its normal resonance, and uh, and also you'll see, you know, complex attacks, right? I I can see it's five meter zones, so around your entire perimeter, I can see uniquely in five in five meter zones. So if three different people are, are are hitting you from three different places, I'll see them all at once. Um, you know, if you'll see high intensity and low intensity, um, or frequency, um, we can catch those within the same zone. Yeah, and uh, like you said, you could program your cameras to once they detect something, they can just automatically swing over, so you can you can get a visual also. Yep, and that's what we normally would do with people that have, um, you know, integrated systems. Right, right. Well, very good. Now, is there anything uh, that you can talk about? You know, that you guys are you got in the works coming up in the future. You know, um, we're you're always, always I mean, I love something. innovation. Yeah, I love innovation. I know you guys are, you know, a very innovative company. You're always coming up with cool ideas and products. Um, we got more ideas than we have time or money. <laughs> money, at any given that's, time. That's the main um, thing. You know, mostly right now we're, we're, we're hugely focused on the fiber optic stuff, um, as, a, as an entire company, just because it's such a big market and, and we have such a good position in it. Yeah. Um, but, 
you know, there's always a few things turning and my applied development guys are working on a few things, but it can't really talk about them yet. I got you. I got you. But when they do become available, we'll talk about them here on Talking Lead. Which is great. This is about the only place I talk about my stuff. <laughs> I think it is, yeah. <laughs> I'm literally not a big talker on this kind of stuff. I, well, a lot I of this stuff you do, to like Marty you... and, and shooting guns. So there's a lot of stuff that you can't talk about, and uh, you know that's understandable. The secret squirrel kind of stuff. But what we can talk about is, you know, we we did the the demonstration, did business first, and then we went out and we had some fun, a little pleasure shooting, where the guys from Tusker Arms uh, came out again with their just unbelievable collection of fully auto rifles, um, submachine guns. It, it was freaking phenomenal. Crew served weapons, even. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, they had a an MG forty two out there from uh, was that World War Two? Yep, World Hitler's War... buzzsaw. Hitler's buzzsaw. Um, they had a nineteen a Browning nineteen nineteen. Your favorite, the Browning B A R. I love the bar, man. That is a that is a hell of a gun, and I, I just have mad respect from from my time in the military, knowing what I carried, just to thinking of the guys in World War II carrying those bars, um, and and even some at the end of World War One, I, I think. Yeah, and then you had a saw. There was a saw out there. Yep. Um, I don't know. There was there were some other ones too. Uh, of course, you had the Barrett fifty cal. We were freaking knocking steel down with that. We actually were trying to cut a tree in half <laughs> with that. Uh, yeah, the 50 is always a crowd pleaser. Did you go take pictures of that tree afterwards? No, I I, I, I meant I think to go. Somebody's and... probably got one. Uh, you know, honestly, it takes a lot more than we think because uh, we didn't um, we didn't do that good of a job on. It. I'm sure the tree wasn't happy. And don't worry, there's thousands of them on that property for all oh, the yeah. huggers. That was there. that was one that was getting ready to go down anyway. So yeah, it was going down. Oh, uh, um, I know. I put 10, 10 rounds in it. And I took a huge chunk out, but it was still standing. Uh, the, the right side probably had about a two to three inch um, gap in it. Oh but honestly, gosh. the rest of it was doing pretty good. That was it? That's all I took out? Yeah, two to three inches. Because <laughs> that's the side I was shooting. I was shooting at the right side over there. And you, yep. I could see the wood flying when I would hit it, too. Yep. And that's, what was cool uh, is there was a, one of them was a tracer round. I hit it with a tracer round. Yeah, I remember the smoke on that one. You see that one? <laughs> but that bar, I mean, that bar, the 50, obviously, I mean, it's, come on. I mean, you feel the 50, right? Oh, my you know, gosh. That's how you experience it. Shakes your That molars. BAR, at, at, you know, almost a, I, I'm just guessing it's a 15-pound weapon. I could probably Google it. Um, you know, yeah, 15 that's shooting 19 that pounds, something in there. 30-30 round. Yeah, that thing's a beast. That's my favorite gun, and Mark brings that one out for me every time. So, uh, great thanks to Mark and the guys at Tusker Arms. Um it was it was a hell of a shoot. I think everybody had a lot of fun and got to shoot things that you know. Some of those are bucket list guns, once in a lifetime guns for a lot of those people that they'll never see or let alone get it get the ability to shoot. Oh, I mean the, the variety that he had. I wish I could remember the other guns that he had out there. Uh, you yeah, just don't uh, see some that. HKs. Uh, he had a C, uh, a Czechoslovakian um, machine gun there on the uh, belt feds yeah. on the crew serves. But uh, and then he had, of course, all the rifles, all your AKs, all your, you know. Yeah, he had the M16. Uh, he had the AK. He had um, a, a micro Uzi. He had the micro, the mini, and the regular Uzi out there. He had all three varieties, and those things would dump a magazine in less than a second. <laughs> it was just, it was just like yep. pulling pulling your lawnmower. It was like whoosh, just done like that. Yeah, the uh, and for all the kids out there, be careful with your uh, micro Uzis. They're uh, they're dangerous. You really got to have a handle on them. Know what you're doing. That's a dangerous gun if you don't. But uh, it's a lot of fun, and it dumps it just like that. My my favorite of all the ones he had out there, I, and I have this gun, of course, the FN P90. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a fully automatic version, and I tell you what, that is something. I didn't that get to shoot that something. one. I didn't see the P90. Oh, uh, yeah. It went down. It had a little malfunction. Um, oh, so okay. probably by the time you got over there, worked your way over, it was out of commission. Did but that, commission. I, within 100 yards, I am completely dead on with my semi-automatic one of those, and I absolutely love it. And this is the first time I've had the opportunity to shoot the fully the automatic. Auto. And I mean, wow. Just wow. I mean, yeah. the firepower and the accuracy that I could put down with that thing was – it. that was phenomenal. That was my favorite – of, of those style of guns. Yeah. Um, well, the that, frame on the, I mean, they're, they're so compact. And then the way it's designed, 
I mean, you can just really get a good brace on that thing and hold it in place. Yeah, and we were shooting at, you know, steel targets from, you know, 500 steel at maybe, I don't know, 25 meters, something like that, yeah. maybe a little. And, uh, you know, with a lot of the other guns, even, you know, with a, with a fully automatic gun, it, it's, it's for, for somebody who's untrained, it's hard to keep your rounds, you know, where they should be. And, um, well, you, you know, had trained, a few times. trained professionals on hand that were keeping an eye on everybody. Oh yeah, you know, getting that that hand back there. I know a lot of the, you know, I'm not being a a, a feminist or anything, uh, not feminist, but a, uh, I guess feminist. A lot of the women would, you know, find themselves going backwards. <laughs> you know, well, instead of yeah, leaning well, it, into it, they lean back. Body weight, a simple body weight, and yeah, and, upper and, body strength, you know, upper body strength, and stuff like that. So it's not. You but know, after it is, what it is, but what I found out is after they shot them, you know, the first time they got the hang of it, and they, oh, yeah. you know, they were they were in there and and hanging in, you know, just as good as some of the guys. Um, but uh, the, and they have the best. I got to tell you, you know, so this is whatever it is, this, but I love the machine gun smile so, on uh, some of those ladies out there. So that was that was great. Oh my! Even even the even the dudes, the Amish guys that were out there. <laughs> So you had a couple of Amish guys that helped yeah, you with Irvin some of your... and his guys, they do a lot of work for us down there at the property and uh, put up some buildings and, you know, do some other, you know, a lot of wood type craft. I think and, uh, they were the... guys, so we invited them to the shoot and they were very excited to uh, get behind. They didn't I... load any of the guns, but they did shoot them. They did shoot. I don't think they were probably the most excited in facial. I mean, their facial expressions of anybody that I saw there. Uh, they and they shot everything too, boy. They were just like getting on it and, oh yeah, me next, me next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was great, man. But uh, they were tearing it up when they got on that fifty. Oh my gosh, the look on their faces, it was priceless. Yeah, and now we my did. F- by the way, you you mentioned safety real quick. I mean, this was a you know this was this you know we take ser- safety extremely extremely um, seriously. Yeah. So we had you know trained range personnel. Every single person, every single person had an assigned range safety with them while they shot, you know, one to one ratio. Yeah. Um, you that know, was very well, through. very well put together, uh, organized event. And, uh, man, it was awesome. I appreciate you doing that. My favorite to shoot was the Thompson submachine gun still. Uh, I love shooting that 45 uh, through that Thompson, man. It's just, it's so smooth. You it know, is smooth. I, I, I'd say it's like you're just like throwing bullets down range with that thing. It's just, it's just like butter, man. It's just like doo, 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 doo. so that smooth, is, and it's quick too. It is quick. The drums. I saw you were, you were shooting some sticks. I, I got an opportunity to shoot a couple of drums. Oh, it. did you do uh, the drums? Nice. Yeah, it was. Uh, man, it's just a, it's a beast. I mean, it is a great weapon, though. Yeah. That, that's probably going to be my next purchase, personally. The Chicago uh, typewriter. Yeah, I'm probably going to get one of those just because it's a fun gun to shoot, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. And everybody likes it. And it's also very easy to control um, compared to some of the other guns. Well, yeah, that's what, yeah, it's very easy to control as far as a full auto goes. Um, compared to that 9 millimeter Uzi that we were shooting. Oh, yeah. It was, and we're shooting a 45. I mean, you would expect 45 to be a lot harder to control than a 9 millimeter, but uh, night and day as far as controllability, ver- the Uzi versus that, uh, that Thompson. Did you shoot the Mac 10? I did. I shot it um, two years ago. I shot two years ago. Yeah, yeah. That's, the, the suppressed one. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the ghetto dumpster there. That's what I call it. <laughs> it just it just dumps that mag like. It's just it, yeah. It's, there's nothing refined about it. It's just like. <laughs> it's just a freaking chainsaw, man. It just chews through those bullets. Uh, how many rounds did that hold? Uh, it's 25 or 30. I don't remember. To 25 be or 30. I mean, it's less than a second. It dumps that. Yeah. It's crazy. So what what are your plans for next year's? You you gonna you gonna up it? Yeah, you know, I mean, gonna go bigger, better. Go- you know, I think we're gonna. It's it'll probably be similar to how it was this year. I mean, I, honestly, we threw out all the stops this year. I, I, no, we gotta know, get some binary out there, man. Get yeah, some- you know, we could do that. Uh, you know, the the we we can throw some binary up on the hill. Get some binary and some bleeding targets from uh, Triumph Systems. Triumph. Triumph Systems. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they've Cue got me those... into that when we do our planning for next year. We'll tag you in. You can tell us all the newest lead, uh, uh, all the new targets and stuff. And we can uh, we can check them out. Definitely, man. I know some people that would be down with that, no doubt. So, real quick, uh, before we we sign off, getting getting close for us to sign off here, I've got a email from one of the leadheads, 
Uh, and his name is George with a J B. And you know who you are, George. I don't know. J J O R G E. Would you pronounce that George or Jorge? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, George, you, you're going to have to send me a phonetic, uh, how you say your name, but I'm going to go with George right now with a J. Um, so he pointed out we had a mistake in last week's uh, show when we had Joe and, and Charlie on. Charlie mistakenly said that OJ was paroled from California, and we threw the California penal system on the uh, the jack wagon train. It was actually Nevada. Nevada, yeah. He, you know, accidents got... happen. People, you know, make mistakes. Uh, we were talking about some California stuff prior to that, so I can see where he. California deserves it, though. But I mean, Ca- I'm just saying. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> California, even though, you know, Jorge, I know you're from there. Jorge, George. <laughs> uh, the Huntington Beach area. But uh, uh, Charlie meant no harm in that. So, Nevada. Uh, I'm not throwing Charlie on the jack wagon train for making that mistake. I've done it several times as well, uh, but uh, we're making the correction here. So the Nevada penal system is being thrown on the jack wagon train, along with California's. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> so also, um, George had submitted some ideas for the Talking Lead uh, Leadhead logo design contest. And uh, he wanted me to to read these out to you guys, even though his his wasn't selected. So he had a couple ideas. Uh, fantastical talking lead head designs. So one is left hand sitting on top of a saddled horse-sized yak that's shooting lasers out of his eyes. <laughs> so so eh, on that one, George. Uh, lefty's gorgeous long... Wind-blown hair is swaying in the wind like Fabio on the cover of a romance novel. <laughs> Check his glamour shots from the uh, from the '90s. He's probably got one he can use. Right, exactly. Lefty is wearing a white Star Wars stormtrooper tactical vest that has a talking lead tactical patch on it. Lefty is holding the Yaks reins with his left red C-3PO arm, rocking his Glock in his right hand while aiming and shooting down zombies. So I like how he's he's like combining genres here with you know the Star Wars sci-fi with the zombie world. I kind of kind of dig that. He's he's getting me a good mind's eye. Right. Everything except the romance novel. There you go. And then he says, in the background, fireworks are going off in the sky while an F-18 flies overhead with the American flags waving in the air. That's a pretty good one. America. But uh, no, George, although those were whimsical ideas, the whole idea was to come up with a a design for you, the listener, the leadhead, not me. It's not about me. It's about you guys. And uh, those top three... We will be posting soon. There's, they're doing a couple of tweaks to them. I'd ask that uh, they, they do a few things to those three finalists. And um, you guys are really going to like these. Once we get them posted, I want you guys to vote on them. Choose your favorite. And then that's the one we're going to do a new t-shirt, a new patch of. So stay tuned for that. I'll be letting you guys know when you can go vote on those. So, Brian, what we did is we had a contest uh, asking the Leadheads to design their own logo, something that they would be proud to wear sport, you know, on a t-shirt uh, that represents them, the Leadhead listener of Talking Lead. And we got a great response on that. Cool. Be excited to see what they come up with. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we're giving you guys another week on the uh, Atlas Defense trivia question where you're going to be able to win a cool Atlas Defense prize package that's going to have uh, t-shirts, their bourbon bullets, their shot glasses, a couple of other items from their their swag store there. Um, so you got another week or so on that. So get your answers in. Go back to last week's episode to find out what you got to do to to enter to win. Hey, so. I got one for you. Okay. What you do know, you we kind of talked about getting. I, I was going to get it right on site, and I admittedly, you know, I, I don't have a lot of experience with with optics on my weapons. I mean, I had an mm-hmm. ACOG in the military. I bought one when I got out. I, I used that. I loved it. Um, you know, but I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to progress a little bit. I, I really was impressed with the right on binoculars. Yeah. So maybe we asked the lead heads, what should I get on my new gun? I've got this gorgeous Nordic components, five, five, six. Okay. What 
from Right On should I put on it? Okay, there you go. That's perfect. So go to Right On USA's website. Look at the different scopes that they have available. And Brian, give them give them a little bit of uh, suggestions on how you're going to use your your new okay. AR. I'll just kind of talk about me a little bit and how I shoot. Like, you know, within a couple hundred meters, I, I'm going to use iron sights. I'm going to put a 45 degree iron sight on the side. A couple hundred meters, I'm using iron sights. That's my preference. I like it. Um, you know, I want to reach out a little bit, and of course, with the 556 five, platform, there's only so far you can go. But you know, from that, I want to get dead on in that 200 to to four maybe even 500 meter range which is mm -hmm. about all my ranges can support anyway right now um i you know if again 556 five, platform um you know i don't want something massive you now know, are you going to be doing any hunting with this you know i'm not a hunter i just okay. like to shoot i shoot a lot what about varmint um, uh, eradication you gonna be doing any varmint eradication coyotes um groundhogs um, you know, you know nah, possums, I, I really don't do any of that stuff where i live okay you know, it, it takes care of itself pretty much. Um, don't really have any issues. Okay. So Brian has a really nice range. And like he said, you know, he goes out to about, you know, 500 meters or so. Um, go to Ride On USA. Go to their, their website, R-I-T-O-N. Look at the, uh, the scopes that they have there and uh, pick out the one that you think would best suit Brian's needs. Yeah. And I'm, you know, a lot of shooting experience, but I just, I, I just never really knew much about optics maybe that's because i didn't hunt and didn't you know do some of those other things and in the military a one time a one by four you know acog was you know that was the best thing i ever got my hands on and i really liked it of course in, in my time in afghanistan bought one when i came home that's on my 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 other um my other 556 five, rig yeah uh, but for this one i, I was kind of looking to you know try something new get a little farther out and uh there you I, go. just the one thing i'm interested in i don't want to be too big you know what i mean i i don't want to you know have don't this overdo lightweight it. gun yeah. and just have this massive scope on it you know what i mean so, so what something, that, something that's going to fit with the gun so what you got to do is you guys um you got to go back and listen to our ride on usa episode where we had brady on and we announced him as being the official optic sponsor of talking lead and uh we get into the basics like I said, uh, we're going to progress that with Brady in future episodes to where we're going to get more advanced in our discussions uh, of optics and the use of optics. Uh, so, Brian, you could benefit from, from listening. I'm going to listen to all those, and I appreciate listening it. To those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, speaking of, we've got another uh, lead head that sent an email in, Jerry B., Jerry has some suggestions. He wrote in and says, so I was thinking about education and what I could use more information about. Uh, he said, I also asked my son, and here are some things we came up with. One, when considering a 300 blackout, what are the advantages of a pistol length versus a rifle length? A, I've had, uh, let's see, I've heard some say the 300 blackout rifle is not a good hunting rifle. <clears throat> why or why not? Uh, I don't know why it wouldn't be. Um, ballistics, <clears throat> some, some basic guidance. When looking at an AR-15, what grain size is better choice for home defense? B, when considering subsonic ammo, what is a good round for hunting deer with various calibers, 30-06, AR platforms, both 15 and 10, etc.? There are lots of choices for handgun type round guns being offered, so the pistol caliber carbines is what he's talking about. Uh, you can get 9mm, 45, etc. in a rifle. Um, and he says, for example, Palmetto State or even uh, Caltech Sub 2000, um, even uh, High Point, for that matter, they make a, a, a nice um, rifle carbine. Why would I choose this type of rifle? What is the best use for a rifle of this type? How do the ballistics for this type of rifle match up or compare to AR platform or other rifles, for example? Are these better as home defense guns? Uh, let's see. He loved the show on optics and suppressors. He wants more uh, info on that. As you said, we're going to be doing more of those. Uh, he wants to get Zeke the Squatch back on uh, and talk <laughs> and talk about the Sonoran Desert Institute and uh, how their programs would help under understand firearms and benefit um, uh, firearm owners. And let's see, maybe a teaser tidbits from some of the courses if Zeke. If not Zeke, then someone else. Uh, I'm sure Zeke would want to would want to do that. So I'm sure that wouldn't be too hard to get Zeke on, and we could talk about some uh, gunsmithing courses that they offer, uh, which I highly recommend. I mean, if you're going to own firearms, you need to know how to work on your firearms, no doubt. 
just from the the few courses that I took from SDI, I, mean, I learned a ton. So yeah, definitely would be beneficial to take some sort of a gunsmithing course. Uh, let's see, a few weeks of shows prior to Black Friday show that will help us wade through the overwhelming deals, discounts, and bargains. Uh, if you guys will just use Talking Lead's discount code, Leadhead, uh, most of our sponsors and a lot of the friends of the show uh, extend a discount to you guys uh, yearly before Black Friday. Now, obviously, Black Friday, people run just ridiculously great deals. So uh, uh, we'll definitely let you know when those deals are out there. Uh, but we don't know a few weeks before because a lot of these companies don't know until maybe the day or two days before what kind of sale they're going to have anyway. So uh, it's it's not us. Uh, it's the companies holding these these sales. So life-saving techniques and equipment. Uh, yeah, I probably need to do a revised show or a, a recent show talking about um, life-saving first aid uh, type type stuff. So we'll get somebody on and talk about first aid and things like that. And, you know, if after you shoot somebody or somebody stabbed, how to, to help with those kind of wounds. Cause you're going to use that. I mean, quite frankly, you're going to use, you're going to need medical skills um, before you'll need gun fighting skills. Cause you're going to be driving down the road and see somebody that's hurt or, you know, walking through the mall and, you know, you might need to help somebody. So pretty important to know first aid. Let's see. Information regarding setting up a trust for guns, silencers, suppressors. And we've done a lot of these, this stuff that you're talking about in past shows. Um, but yeah, I mean, we could do some, some recent I shows. I did that a this. couple, I don't know, about a year ago. I set up my trust. Wow, awesome. Good for yeah, you. Yeah, it was pretty easy, honestly. I it mean, is. It's pretty easy. It's pretty inexpensive. Uh, yeah, now, as far as gun, gun trusts go now, I mean, Obama got that law passed that, uh, now, you know, everybody on the trust now, I think, has to have a background check and, you know, do some things. But still a good idea to have one set up if you're going to own um, NFA-type items. So, yeah, we'll get uh, probably get Joe back on and, and talk about that a little bit. And we did talk about it a while back with VSO Gun Channel, Curtis Halstrom. Uh, I do recall that we did, uh, it was right before they were getting ready to pass that law, we were talking about it, so... Very good. All right. So any of you lead heads, you got questions, you got suggestions for the show, you got jack wagons, you want to throw on the jack wagon train, you got suggestions for facts to fight the miss, email those to us at talkingled at gmail.com. And please, wherever you're listening to this show, where it's iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, you know, your favorite podcasting um, app, leave us some feedback, you know, do a review on there for us because that helps us in the ratings. Um, and even if you're not, download an app and go leave us a review anyway. <laughs> so uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Brian, thank you so much again for being on the show, taking the time. I know um, you've got a busy weekend ahead of you here. And uh, that was just a great shoot that you had again. Uh, I hope you continue to do that every year. Yeah, no, man. And we'll keep inviting you out, dude. It's fun to have you there. And, uh, once we get, a, we got a lot of video. We, this year we had a, a dedicated video and uh camera crew out there. So I'll make sure we share those pictures with you. Awesome. Very good. And we'll be posting those in the, the, those videos and those pictures. So you guys make sure you check our social media. Uh, I've got a great video of the, the demonstration that you did. And uh, I'll be working with Brian, and if he gives me the thumbs up, I'll post that on YouTube so you guys can actually see this uh, FOD in action. It's it's pretty impressive. Appreciate yeah. it, man. Thank you. Big thanks to all our sponsors, Frontier Tactical. Check them out, FrontierTactical.com. X-Steel Targets, XSteelTargets.com. Modern Spartan Systems. Check them out at ModernSpartanSystems.com. Right on USA, the official optics of talking lead. And make sure you guys uh, submit some suggestions for Brian for which uh, which piece of glass he needs to put on his AR-15. Uh, email I those it. Email those to me at talkinglet at gmail.com. Optics noob. There you go. Well, I am too. You know, that's what I was talking about in our, in our episode when we got Brady on. And that's why I wanted to get those guys on as a sponsor is, uh, you know, I've, I've really immersed myself into, you know, the rifles and the handguns and, you know, the ins and outs of that and taking gunsmithing courses. And I never really got into the optics. Uh, but you, know, you talk to, to to most of the experts and they will tell you that, you know, the optics is the most important thing that you can have you know, on your rifle. 
And, uh, you know, a lot of them say you're supposed to spend double the amount you spend on your rifle, which, you know, I don't buy that horse shit right now because right on USA, their optics are extremely affordable and they are, of, you know, probably some of the highest quality that I've seen. Um, now, like they say, they don't compete with Leupold or, you know, some of those $10,000 price scopes, but their optics are just as good if, you know, if not better than some of those. And it's a veteran owned company family owned um com- completely honest honest and they've got the best warranty brian in the industry if you don't like your scope they give you, you know, for any reason uh, i think it's like 90 days or something like that you can send it back and they'll give you a refund if at any time during the life of your scope it breaks you send it in and they're not gonna they're not gonna fix it they're just gonna replace it they're gonna give you a brand new one <laughs> And that, you know, I've seen a lot of veteran companies, and we, we do our warranties pretty similar when we send products out, man, because it's just, well, I'm going to give you some shit that works. Right. right? You know, it's it's not some big corporate thing saying, oh, well, you know, no, it's all right, I'm going to make it right. You know. Yeah, there's nothing. I love no, that. Nobody that understands, you know, needing things to work when they need to work than a veteran, you know, especially a combat veteran. I love it. I love it. And, you know, I... All I needed to do was look through those binos. That, you know, <laughs> it that did it all, had, didn't it? I, yep. That, that, okay. I, I'd love to see one of their. I'd love to have one of their scopes. And honestly, the price point's good, so that's why I'm saying Leadheads help me figure out the right one. I'm not worried about in in that range. I'm not worried about the price. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. putting it on a, a really nice gun, and you know, so let's go. You're gonna you're gonna get the you and for that price to have a have a warranty like that attached to it. If it breaks at any time or malfunctions, you just send it back, and they're gonna send you a brand new one to replace it can't beat that no right on usa baby glock the official carry of talking lead and uh we i'll be getting you guys some more info on glock coming up some new products hopefully that uh, they're going to be releasing to the general public and uh, that's that's coming up i'm leaving actually monday to go do that well, I'm actually, believe it or not, I'm going to pick up one of those MHSs if they come out with it. Um, I will. I, oh, I've yeah. always been. I'm not a Glock guy, though, and I'm not saying that disrespectfully. Glock It's just, you know, I've always been. A, I, I've always really liked to have my safety up there, and, and every gun that I carry, I, I don't know why, Army days, whatever, you know. I, mm-hmm. I, it's not that I fear that it's going to go off. I, I know they're completely reliable. It's none of that. It's just my training my muscle memory that's what i know how to, you know that's what i remember exactly. that's that's it's a step that you've got yeah, in that's my step. discharging your firearm yeah yeah and uh you know i just i don't want to try to work around that i want to work with it so i'm actually kind of excited that it has that so uh i'm definitely going to pick one up very cool and again i'm speculating guys i don't know that that's you know what they're going to be doing i'm just speculating just a joe schmo here uh, using my educated guess <laughs> Maybe it's a carbine they're coming out with. Maybe it's a rifle. They're, you know, I don't know. <laughs> a Glock rifle? How awesome would that be? A Glock AR. I would buy it. Hells yeah, in a heartbeat. But until then, if you uh, if you want a a uh, PCC pistol caliber carbine in Glock, Nordic Components makes a phenomenal nine millimeter that's compatible with your Glock. And oh, by the way. Uh, you just pop out the magwell and you can put in uh, an adapter uh, or actually an adapter. It's another magwell that fit uh, Smith and Wesson. It'll fit 1911. It'll fit, you know, whatever. Um, they've got the adapters that'll go on that platform. You just buy the magwell that you need and uh, it'll go for your brand, SIG, you know, whatever it may be. Pretty fucking cool. Well, Brian, that, good, man. that's uh, that's it for the show. We're going to wrap it up here. Um we got to have you on again. Are we going to see you at uh, SHOT Show this year? I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Yeah, you kind of... going different directions with our ASP product and uh, looking to possibly... Uh, somebody's trying to buy the rights to that, at least in some of the markets. So okay, we'll I'm sell not sure. it to this them. This is the first year I'm not sure. Sell it to them and just come out as a freaking I would spectator, love man. Well, we got a lot of other stuff in, in those types of markets. You so, can be uh, my co-host. You can come out as media with Talking Lady. You can be my co-host. Outstanding. Uh, that might be fun, dude. It I will think it be, would fun. be fun. You know, my biggest problem with Shot Show is all the money I spend on the side. <laughs> <laughs> I can't control that. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> Unfortunately. Neither can I. That's why I don't like to go too often. Well, uh, I only go once or twice a year. Hopefully, it'll turn out like last time and you'll hit it big. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that you was know. pretty good. Uh, Antirus Alliance, real quick. Antirus Alliance, um, which Talking Land is a member of, and I am personally a lifetime member of. 
is going to be having a try and buy event uh, before SHOT Show this year. It'll be like the two days before SHOT Show. I think it'll overlap with SHOT Show's range day as well, but definitely the day before they even start that. Um, out at the same gun range that it was at last year. Um, do you remember where that was? Did you you didn't come they out for were that? Out did at you? the Pro Gun Club, weren't they? Yeah, the Pro Gun Club. That's exactly where it was. Yeah, I used to be a member out there because my parents had a house in Henderson. I used to be a member at Pro Gun Club. Yeah, it's a nice facility. It is, and it they uh, they only had a few ranges last year, but this year they're taking over the whole the whole facility with their try and buy event. So it's going to be a huge event, and if any of you lead heads are out there, put that on your calendar. Uh, you can go to uh, Antirus's uh, website and uh, get more details on that. And we'll be talking about it more in the days to come. Um, but I just wanted to throw that out there and let everybody know that that was going to be um, coming up this year, too. So. Sounds good, man. Appreciate you having us on. And yeah, thanks for man. coming all the way out to our shoot. I know it was a stretch to have to... Uh, uh, Take your day up shooting all those fine weapons from Tusker. Oh Arms. yeah, man! It was just it was painful. I hated doing that. I just <laughs> work, 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 work. <laughs> and as always, lead heads keep your loved ones close. Firearms closer. Boom! Your fiber optic detective systems even closer. It's gonna tell you what's coming. <laughs> <laughs>